the question is, what do we do about all these things? There's a lot more to say about the nature of creativity and its relationship, our relationship with tools and technology. It's worth noticing that even the most sophisticated computer currently has no ideas of its own, maybe someday. Uh, the richest, most expensive set of instruments have no music in them. The music is in the musicians and their ability to bring the music from the instruments. The tools do not replace the need for creative education. They create new opportunities for us to enhance that education. People still need to invest in their imaginations. They need the tools and the tools that will make these things come to life. And we need to understand their proper relationship with our attempts to grow and enrich our own humanity. If education isn't about that, it's not about much. There's a big shift here that I just want to advertise and open this up, John, if we may. I've written a lot in other places about, and doing out of our minds, about the origins of our current systems of in the Industrial Revolution, and the extent to which our current habits of education are modelled on the principles of conformity, compliance and linearity, which are central operating principles for industrial production. If you have a manufacturing plan, you don't want a million things coming out unpredictably, you want them all to come out with very few deviations. But you know, the real analogy here, I realise, is not with manufacturing. The real analogy for education, if we're to take this revolution seriously, is with industrial agriculture. During the Industrial Revolution of the 18th century and 19th centuries, there was, a, there was a transformation in manufacturing, but there was a transformation in the use of the land. The machines that were developed were used to cultivate crops on a much bigger scale than ever before. There were really three big innovations that led to the mass production of food through industrial farming. Uh, machinery, great threshing machines and plows and so on. Chemical fertilizers and pesticides. And they all had to work together because industrial farming is based on great monocultural plantations of single crops, all potatoes, all rapeseed, all asparagus, whatever it is. But having huge monocultures removes a lot of the natural protection that nature provides in a diverse farming system. And therefore, there was a huge demand for chemical um, pesticides to keep disease away from the crops. It worked. During the 18th and 19th century, the population of the Earth went from a billion to about four billion, and it's now heading for nine billion, and it's been made partly possible by increased yields and output in the production of food. Here's the thing, though. The price we're paying for all that is that we're destroying the ground beneath our feet. We're polluting the waterways, we're destroying the rivers, we're killing off ecosystems at an unfathomable scale, and we've destroyed topsoils all around the world. And the reason is that industrial farming is focused on output, on yield. It sounds paradoxical to say this, but industrial farming is about the plant, not about the soil. The soil keeps being pumped full of more uh, uh, fertilizers to get more plants out. And they're bigger, but we're doing the same thing with animals. We have created systems of industrial farming of animals which are grotesquely inhumane, living creatures, kept in appalling conditions very often, unable to move, fattened up, but prone to all sorts of disease which are warded off through antibiotics and then we eat this stuff. And it's all contributed to some of our well-being, but it's also the root of the largest epidemic of diabetes and obesity in the history of the Earth. And it's not sustainable. That's the point. We are running out of road with this model. Organic farming, is based on opposite principles of diverse planting, rotation. But the really crucial thing about organic farming is the focus is not on the plant, it's on the soil. The assumption is if we get the soil right, the plants will be fine. If we think of diversity, they'll be self-protecting, much more so than in monocultural systems. I hope the analogy is clear here with education. We've developed systems of education in the image of these things which are increasingly about output and yield, test results, <laughs> international lead tables, graduation rates. And on the way, we are creating a sterile culture in which people are suffering and becoming drained. And my argument is that human life is inherently creative, but it flourishes under certain conditions. And all the great schools I know, and for many of them, are not obsessed with output. 
They're obsessed with culture. That's the equivalent. If you get the culture of education right, if you uh, promote diversity, if you create conditions where people can interact creatively together, if you value different sorts of talents, if you treat people humanely, then the culture of education almost guarantees the results that you're sacrificing in this massive in the abstract. So the revolution I think we have to move towards is an organic concept of education in which we seek to enrich the culture of schools through a different sense of value, the lives and talents that people work in, and the teachers and the kids, by the way. And I want to show you one last little video clip, it's quite short. I came across this, it just seems to me to summarize beautifully a lot of things that I've been campaigning around for quite a long time. I'll just show it to you, I'll have a quick word afterwards, and then we'll have some questions. So Lee, could you play Landfill? Some of you may have seen this, but if you haven't, I really would like you to. This is in uh, Paraguay, as we're moving around the world. Este chelo está hecho de una lata de aceite, la madera tirada en la basura y las clarijas son de una vieja cuchara para golpear la carne y para hacer el ñoquis. Y suena así. La pandemia que acá vive recicla todo lo que hay en la basura y se vende. No pensaba antes que yo voy a hacer esa mano, Y siento que si yo perdí cuando estoy viendo a un niño que está tocando un niño que es un niño reciclado. Cuando yo escuché a los familiares de mí diciendo como mariposas en el estómago, así, no sé si es así, como se puede explicar. La orquesta de instrumentos reciclados es una orquesta que toca instrumentos hechos por la basura. He once said that civilization is a race between education and catastrophe. I think that's right. There was 
there's a great website in the US called The Onion, which is a bit like Private Eye. I know it's a satirical website. And they had a whole thing there about how we have to save the planet. And they said, effectively, like, don't worry about the planet. You know, the planet's going to be fine. Obviously. The Earth has been around for over four and a half billion years. Human beings have been around for about 150,000 years in our current form. We were cooking a long time, but, but in our current form. I mean, it's impossible to picture that, I think. But if you to think of the whole history of the Earth mm -hmm. one year, human beings showed up at less than a minute to midnight on the 31st of December. So, you know, we're pretty recent. What we're actually doing is imperiling the conditions of our own survival on the planet as humanity. Now, the Earth may well conclude, we tried humanity, not so good. You know, <laughs> we're going back to bacteria. They were fantastic, actually. They lasted so long. Because the Earth has another five billion years to run. We are creating conditions which are inimical to our own well-being. And education is the principal way in which we can unleash the creative talents, abilities, vision, and sense of possibility that all human beings are born with and which could be transformed of our own cultures and of our own lives. But it does depend upon our thinking of education not as some industrial process, but as a human process in which everything else should be subservient. Our job is not to teach the national curriculum, it's to teach our children and to use whatever resources are best available to us to do that. There was a, do you know the poet Anais Nin? Uh, she, uh, you Google her, but uh, if you don't know her, but she, she's credited with writing a very small, among other things, a small poem called Risk. I like it for the obvious reason. She, she talked about her own creative journey. She became a writer later in her life and discovered a talent she didn't quite know she had. But she was on a search for it because her life was going in the wrong direction. And she said, then she had to decide whether to embrace it or not. But she said, this is it. Uh, there came a point where the risk of remaining tight in a bud was greater than the risk it took to blossom. And I think that captures something very important. We spend a lot of time constraining our own talents, constraining our kids, keeping them with the program. But if we would just take a risk and invest in people's talents and possibilities, I think we might see something miraculous. I think we would see a harvest of possibility that we may not be able to imagine at the moment, but which we will all, in the end, find of immense benefit, both personally and collectively. I think that's the great charge of educators. It's why I work in it. It's why I promote education. And it's why I think our relationship with technology is so important in these conversations too. So thank you very much. Thank you for what you do. Thank you for coming.